Hello, it's Duncan Bolan on one of my video thinks. I'm Duncan Bolan, the Purpose Coach, um, speaking to you from um, amidst lockdown and uh, the impact that that's all making on our lives. So what I'm trying to do today is I'm sharing you um, some information on bereavement. Um, bereavement, loss, change. Often um, people are likening grief, the grieving process, um, to when we, we lose a loved one or we lose something like our job. Uh, anything that's kind of completely unsettling and turns our lives upside down and sort of sends us into a, a period of turmoil. Um, I've been working with this model now for about 20 to 23 years. Um, I only wish I'd found it earlier. Um, I lost my father when I was uh, 20 and um, being a northern male it was kind of chest chest forward shoulders back and um, not allowed to grieve and actually it took me five years to recover from how toxic that kind of mindset was and when I've uh, been doing redundancy counselling with my clients um, many thousands of clients in the last 20 years I have to say um, that using this grief curve has translated beautifully in helping them make sense of what they're going through and what the emotions are that they're experiencing. It is not a silver bullet. It will not cure everybody's sense of grief, pain, or any of the emotions that we go through. I do not claim that it can um, wave some sort of magic wand in, in recovering uh, from loss or going through significant change in our lives what it can do is perhaps shine something of a light into the abyss that we go in go through when um, these massive life events impact upon us so it was created by a woman called elizabeth kubler ross in the early 1970s um, there are so many different versions of this model now it's it's kind of beggar's belief I um, believe that there are still the original seven phases of grief that she discussed, um, although I've seen people talking about 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 different curves within the curve and emotions within the emotions. And I just think the more complicated uh, we make it, the less useful it is, the less practical it is. So there's a curve which is kind of almost like an, an upside down bell curve that we enter into when we experience loss and if you can imagine that the the y axis is depths of emotion and the x axis is time and i don't think i've ever drawn this this model um quite the same twice so let's see what we get to today the emotions that I put in here uh, are always the same and I'm going to kind of see if I can split them up into the red and the green. So on the red side, when we lose a loved one or this life event impacts upon us, or the general reflex is that we go through the phases of shock, anger, denial, And then down here at the bottom, I put stress. Also, I, uh, I've qualified this over the years to be relevant. And this is an amendment that I've made of my own. It's not of the original model, but it this, these things affect people in different ways. And it can, when we get to the, to the bottom of the curve and we go through this period of stress, it can certainly manifest as um, full-blown clinical depression down here. And some people may experience versions of anxiety. I won't say it's, I won't belittle it in saying it's mild anxiety but it's, no, it's not a clinical form of depression. 
Now, just before I start talking more about what's happening on this, uh, on the left hand side, I'm going to continue through to where we come out. So, shock, anger, denial, stress, apathy, acceptance. And then action. Now, having accompanied many hundreds of people through the grieving process, myself included, I should say also that this is further qualified by my own personal experience of having lost a child five years ago which I'm not going to go into now, but it's kind of this model has been verified by my own personal experience with the loss of my father, which is a grief experience that I did not handle well. And latterly, um, with the loss of a child, I can again say I did not handle that grieving process well because the impact was so great. But what I can say is having done this for so many years now, for two decades, um, this model seems to have made an awful lot of sense of it for an awful lot of people who I've been working with. So on a day by day basis, when we first enter into this curve, I don't think there's any doubt that what my clients and I have experienced is that each day is its own collection of miniature cr curves. So we go through the total um, gamut of emotional phases and shocks and various things. And each day can be a, a journey from shock to anger to denial all the way through kind of through to acceptance. And what we tend to think is sometimes we, we, just, we get this sense that we're making our way through and up the other side of this very dark valley, this life chapter, and then we can slip down. We can slip back down and we can even go all the way back like snakes and ladders slipping down the snake, we can go all the way back to the beginning and start reprocessing the grief over and over again. So as, as it turns out, this churn effect goes on here in the middle. And that churn can be extremely confusing and anxiety causing. And if we don't handle it well, I believe that we shift in towards this clinical depression. And some people might argue that that version of depression is inevitable. Um, it can be with death and handling death. We can go through um, gradations of depression, I'm sure. But I'm not a psychotherapist. That's somebody else's feel. I'm a coach, so I don't approach it from that angle and if somebody is looking like being clinically depressed I've got some signals that I'm looking for and I seek to signpost that person onwards to somebody who might take them through a therapeutic approach but nevertheless just by taking somebody walking somebody through this diagram sometimes it can help them make sense of, of grief talking focusing less on the death version of this curve, more on change, job loss, um, redundancy, significant change, disruption, perhaps things like divorce, we can go through this process again. So if it's something like job loss, somebody can be um, robbed, bereft of their identity. There could be a, an engineer, I've worked with an engineer who designed um, helmet displays for fast jets in the RAF to help the pilots um, operate fighter jets. And he did this job for 25, 30 years and he lost his job and he was really, really kind of rocked back on his feet. Um, and it turns out that when we started looking at his achievements and his back catalogue of his preferences, you know, where his career attributes lay, where his skills, what, what his skills were, um, the, his, 
work preference, his work style, his learning uh, preferences, you know, what he, who he was as a person, you know, how that actually turned out looking like he said, so you're saying I've been a maths teacher this whole time and I never direct anybody towards a career decision. But as it turned out, he went and did a, you know, in, at least into his 50s, he went and did a, um, a qualification, a teaching qualification, because his passion was actually working with, with maths and numbers. That he used that an awful lot in his job. So what we, what we did was we, we developed, we put into this big space in here what I call my career dovetail, which you can find out information on elsewhere. But these are his achievement stories. He's talking, he start, we, start, we worked on building up his language of success. So he started to do the introspection with the guidance and the, um, using the coach as a thinking partner. I'm, all I am is a thinking partner. But using this thinking partnership, he started to generate self-knowledge in more positive terms and started to develop a feel for who he was as a person and a working person, and kind of what, he's, what he wanted out of life and you know, what his purpose might be ultimately to try and build that into his, his uh, recovery. Um, but going through this phase, what I, where they end up coming out, and I add on another piece here, is there's an angle of rebirth here. People, and this is the important bit for me, rebirth. And this is, a, it sounds perverse, but most people enter into this process at a particular altitude, you know, equals N. And they expect to leave the curve back to where it was. And it's probably never going to go, we're never going to go back to the old version of ourselves. We never, we might never see that person again. That's certainly been the case for me in my experience. Because what's actually happened that rather than come out at the same altitude, at the, as the same person emotionally, what I believe has happened is that we come out at an angle of growth, greater. So what doesn't kill us makes us strong. It's a very important thing to reflect upon. This is not, as I say, a silver bullet. It's not a magic wand. It's not a cure-all. It's not going to just suddenly make you feel better. We've actually got to go through a slow recovery process and take the time to turn the stones of the life journey that we've been on, look underneath them and have a look and see who we are. You know, what have, what have become our blind spots? You know, who are we behind the blind spots that we inevitably build? We build up these defense mechanisms around ourselves to cope with life. And this opportunity, sometimes, when we have to take a forced stop to recover and to recuperate and to reflect, where it ends up is that we can grow X degrees as a result of this. And I'm almost finished this short film upon the bereavement curve and the change curve, as some people prefer to call it. But I just want to focus for a moment on, on anger. And people don't like me talking about anger, it seems. There's been some banter about this on the internet recently, on social networking. So this is, um, this is the anger bit. And I've got some other words that I might call anger. So if I care deeply about a person or a life experience such as my career, then I'm going to care deeply about that. And if that thing is taken away from me, that person is taken away from me, I can, that can manifest as bona fide frustration. And these are all gradations of anger. What I just really want to focus upon is after we've gone through the shock and we're rocked backwards on our heels, and we end, we might go into a long, uh, prolonged denial phase, which is really, really dangerous. That we don't think we're going through this process. We deny, our, we're in denial of the actual processing required to recover. We can get stuck at various points. Obviously, apathy 
is a phase which is very closely connected down here to the depression and the stress uh, phase of, of grief. This apathetic phase that we can go through can be can be incredibly um, difficult. It's a place where we can get stuck in the glue and the mud of not knowing. But just focusing on this anger for a moment. What I find is when you discuss grief and shock and the, 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 the bereavement process with the person that I'm working with, anger is a burning. Anger is a caring. Anger is the light. We can extract so much about a person's profile and their cosmetic makeup as who they are as a being from actually what's happening in this phase here. Now, this is where you find out what they care about. You know, why am I indignant? Why am I really, really cross about this? What was it about that person who's been ripped away from me that I really, really loved? What were the qualities within them that reflected back on me in the form of love? So what we can get from the anger phase is what we love. You know, what do we love? What, what is the meaning of this? Where do we extract the meaning of this whole processing of grief, this turmoil, this torment? Is the torment often stems from the loss and the loss is what makes us cross and sad. It's what we care about. It's what frustrates us, that the world has lost this thing. The world has lost me in my lovely job. I am so cross. I want to do something about it. And where it ends up being is it's the fuel that can propel us to the other side. Rather than get stuck and hung up in denial, let's talk the anger out. Let's embrace the anger bit. Why do we care? Why do we want to do something about this? What do I want to do in the world to make this better? That person's not going to come back. But what were the qualities about that missing ingredient in our life that I really care about? And I could labour this point on and on and on, but I think you get my point. Is that when we go through this seven stages of grief, the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross bereavement curve is how powerful is this as a tool to help us navigate significant change in our, in our life and I'm happy to field anybody's queries or challenges or whatever you might feel as a result of having watched this short film because it's something which means a great deal to me in my heart you know I've struggled with grief personally it's been a massive impact upon my life and I get cross when people say I can't get angry about it because I can get angry about it I have been angry about it there is too much injustice in the world and I want to put that right and if people are told they can't get angry then there's something wrong with the whole processing process the methodology that we might use and all I hope at the end of the day is that just by letting you know that we make our way through this difficulty in our life it's inevitable we are going to face significant change in life it is as much a part of life as the living of it we have to accept that but once we have once we are armed with some tools and some insight into how we go through the other side we might actually grow as a person we might move up in our becoming more wise because we're better equipped and that's all I want to say as I say if I can help anybody go through this if I can help anybody process grief process change at all then please feel free to reach out thank you